Welcome to the Strong for Life podcast. I'm your host, Connor O'Shea, and today I'm joined by Phil White. So I came across Phil about two, maybe even three years ago now. I was doing the UMS Unity Gym online program, and Phil was sharing some really, really helpful inf- information around rehab. So Phil, welcome to the show, and why don't we start with a bit about yourself, who you are, and what you do. Yeah, thank you so much. It's uh, so nice to to put a I know, an, a moving face to a name. I've seen your, your picture and everything pop up plenty of time, but haven't had the, the chance to chat. But um, yeah, fantastic to, to finally get to meet you properly. And um, yeah, uh, just a bit of background. So as kind of said, I've um, been a physiotherapist and working uh, predominantly out of what was Unity Gym. They've now uh, recently gone entirely online and a, a CrossFit gym's taken over. So that's um, definitely thrown up a, a few extra um, interesting challenges. Um, and yeah, before that, I was a, um, kind of a, a bit of a lost soul after spending all of my, um, my end, the end of teenage years playing ultimate Frisbee, got really, really into that, got injured a whole lot. I uh, started doing it, like thinking I was going to do a teaching degree, uh, realized that that had nothing like, although I loved working with people, um, it wasn't what I was passionate about. And so I ended up doing a, a short massage diploma, um, or a short massage course just to do something practical and a bit more related to uh, my interest, which was just sport all the time at the time. And if you haven't, if you don't know about Ultimate Frisbee, check it out. It's not just standing there throwing it. It's a sprinting, running around, <laughs> jumping, diving sort of game. Um, but yeah, after doing that short massage course, it was the first time I'd ever really felt so passionate about studying something. I'd always sort of cruise through school without engaging too much, but um, yeah, learning about anatomy and then having really importantly, something practical to apply it to in the form of um, these treatments was just uh, just sent my brain on fire and just couldn't get enough of it. So uh, ended up following through, the, like dropping the teaching degree, doing a full um, uh, year of the massage diploma and have been working as a massage therapist. Then while I studied um, an exercise sports science degree and then a doctor of physio uh, three-year postgrad as well. So ended up spending my whole year, my whole twenties in um, <laughs> at uni. I've got the hex debt, which is the student loan debt to uh, <laughs> to show for it. But um, yeah, I just couldn't be more stoked as to have figured that out and um, yeah, followed this path. Yeah, mate, for sure. So that that's really cool um, that you went on that path. How old are you now, Phil? So I'm 32. Now. 32. Cool. I have uh, recently shaved, so if there is a video component to the episode, I, I do feel like a. I look, um, you know, about 20 years younger at the moment, but I, I promise I am in my thirties. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, mate. And then with the physiotherapy, was that always, cause you, your whole, I guess what I really appreciate about what you do, it's all about like strength and performance, getting people back to performing optimally and integrating, you know, a structured program with the rehab. So was that always the case straight out of physio or did that change? And, and if so, how did you learn about it? Yeah, I think um, it was quite a, I'm, I'm really glad in hindsight now, despite the fact it did mean that I've now just got to my thirties and I've just started earning instead of <laughs> uh, been working the whole time. But I'm kind of glad I went way, that way around because I feel like when you go into the physiotherapy degree, you sort of go in with this uh, feeling like you're going to unlock the secrets to you know, how to keep everyone injury free and, um, you know, change, blow people's minds with like fancy complicated, uh, movement tests, but also, uh, treatments like hands-on kind of treatments and also, uh, specific, really specific movements that are just the key to overcoming injury. And it was quite a eye-opening fact as I went through my twenties and, and sort of started to realize like having gone to lots of different treatment modalities from, as I was an injured athlete, just constantly um, hurting myself, like working with, um, I remember my parents took me to an osteopath when I was 12, where you got some massage and some like hands-on uh, treatment then. And I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. And then um, went and saw physios after doing a really bad ankle injury for the first time when I was 16, which then started a string of <laughs> uh, that recurrent injury um, and end up seeing lots of different physios over the years and, and just being kind of baffled by how different everyone's approach seemed to be and that there was sort of no like consistent thing. And then also I just found like the whole experience quite frustrating a lot of the time because you'd sort of end up going, you'd be shown these like little things that, you know, if you did them a few times, you might feel slightly different, but then it just started to really like 
strike me as I, I kind of progressed further into um, when I stopped playing ultimate frisbee competitively after doing five world championships, I was like, oh, maybe there's other things I can do in my life and not spend all of my um, time and money on uh, traveling around playing this obscure sport. Uh, and I started training um, seriously in the, the gym and it was it was Yanni from Unity Gym who came in to get a massage um, at the clinic I was in at the time and tried to convince me to come to this gym and I was like, oh, no, nah, mate, not really a gym person, not for me. <laughs> and then because uh, I'd gone to like crunch fitness for $6 a week and then turned up once, looked at what other people were doing on the machines. Uh, <laughs> I can't not, think like, of felt very, a felt more very different self-conscious. experience between <laughs> crunch and unity. <laughs> yeah. And then went to unity gym and I was like, whoa, this is different. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. My mate and I just, um, became totally obsessed and, and went constantly and, um, and started working really closely with them. And after a couple of years of, of training with, um, with them, uh, he, one of the other guys who'd been working at the, um, big box gym that unity, um, the unity guys came from. So from the fitness first, um, uh, was a guy, Sebastian Oreb, who is a very well-known powerlifting coach. He's a Australian strength coach on, um, on Instagram. And he started training at unity gym while he was building his own gym, which is now base gym. And yeah, so just for a bit of a, a wrap on this guy, he's, uh, if you watch Game of Thrones or if you know Hathor Bjornsson, which I think with your target market, um, most people would, <laughs> uh, six foot 10, uh, strong man who did that. He's done the world's heaviest deadlift. Um, I know you're from the UK, so maybe you're at Eddie Hall, uh, oh, Ireland, <laughs> but Ireland might be careful. I, I know you're, you, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I was like, well, I'm not sure which part of Ireland you're from. So <laughs> could <laughs> what, what's but, the deadlift weight that he, so, uh, he so Eddie Hall, Eddie Hall did the, an official 500 kilo. He was the first person to ever lift 500 kilos, a deadlift, which is just a mind boggling amount of, um, uh, amount of weight. And then, during COVID uh, and after this big beef between Eddie and, and Hathor, uh, after like a spec, like a, this call that the referees made in the world's strongest man, which meant that Eddie beat Hathor. Uh, Hathor did a unofficial because it wasn't at a an official event, 501 kilo, just to <laughs> <laughs> get that heaviest ever deadlift. Yeah. Uh, did it, made it look pretty comfortable. And whereas Eddie had fainted with blood coming out of his nose. So <laughs> anyway... <laughs> All of this to say, uh, Australian strength coach Sebastian Oreb, who was training at Unity Gym um, and coaching out of there, I started working quite closely with him, doing massage treatments in re- in return for being able to train at his new gym and uh, doing some about a year and a half of powerlifting training with him, which then went on to doing um, becoming like a kind of an anatomy consultant for his like personal trainer certification courses, where we went in and uh, drew muscles on. Uh, lots of these like amazing athletes and you know we're painting glutes onto um uh sunny webster who's one of the best um uh weightlifters from uh, who represented um the olympics for for gb so you know pretty fun sort of <laughs> projects to be involved with but yeah to come back to your original question like when going through all these physio experiences of getting a couple of little theraband exercises that you meant to do for a couple of you know a few times uh, you know, for a couple of weeks and then comparing that to like legit strength and conditioning programming and just seeing how much of an effect proper integrated strength and performance like programming. In. And at the time I was also working for the um, Giants AFL club. So AFL is a bit of a, a wacky sport, but we got plenty of Irish people out um, playing it who are Gaelic football stars who <laughs> come across. Yeah. Um, but AFL is, if you haven't watched it before, definitely would uh, recommend, but I was also doing massages at, um, that club, um, for the six years there. And I guess seeing kind of strength and conditioning programming and all of the things that go into turning athletes from, you know, um, like into, to, to be able to do what they do. Like it just, there was just this disconnect of like doing some <laughs> like, like dispersed shitty exercises where you feel like you're in the exercise naughty corner just didn't really square with doing like fun training that actually is building you towards being a more resilient person and that kind of builds a identity of being someone who's strong and capable rather than so much of what physios businesses are often built on is kind of giving people an injury identity which that means they only feel like they can get better if they come back and get endless treatment not only physio but also chiros and and all health practitioners i think there's that tendency not everyone but 
mate. So uh, let's kind of talk about that. Let's just say a lot of the people are kind of guys kind of our age and above. So kind of 30s, 40s, 50s. They've got some sort of issue like shoulders, lower back, knees, hips, whatever. What's the kind of, you know, you've been seeing a lot of people in a lot of different environments for quite a long time now. And you've been working in, in a lot of um, different environments. So what are the common I guess, issues you see guys in particular coming into you with, what are the kind of common mistakes or traps they fall into? And can you give advice about kind of how to overcome them? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, which will give value to everyone instead of just like a nice rotator cuff injuries. Like I think the biggest bit of advice is to try and see every injury as an opportunity. It's so common that people get into these downward spirals when they get injured, where basically you have something that hurts you and then you withdraw yourself from that activity and then you're like, oh, just rest it and then get back to what I was doing after the <clears throat> a bit of rest. And then because your body adapts to what you spend your time doing, if you then withdraw yourself from that activity, <clears throat> your capacity for doing work will decrease. And as I've found out, as you get past 30, um, you're <laughs> you definitely uh, like get, uh, you don't, uh, hold on to your strength quite as well and you, you become uh, weaker quicker and that is <clears throat> so scientifically uh, shown that basically you, you hit your peak muscle um, mass and your ability to um, put on muscle and uh, and bone mineral density at, at around the age of 30 and then you start to gradually um, over time decline and so it's just so key particularly for people in this age group is like you just need to be giving your body stimulus constantly because one of the most instructive and, and enjoyable placements I did uh, was certainly not in the musculoskeletal um, prior practice, but was actually in geriatric subacute rehab, where I went into this um, this rehab hospital where basically people had had uh, usually the most common thing was um, falls where they broke broken their hip and had um, hip replacements, and it was this like six week intensive hospital where they had basically had to make the decision whether they'd go back to being independent again or be institutionalized in, in nursing homes or uh, hospices for the rest of their, um, the rest of their life. And I'm so glad that our generation and the generations younger than us have been instilled with generally a, like more of a appreciation for exercise throughout a lifetime. And I think that, you know, there's so many people in their thirties now who will continue training forever, um, which is so good because certainly in my parents' age, like, age kind of category uh you know there are just lots of people who you know they liked playing sports as a kid got to the like mid-20s had a family and then never did anything with their body ever again and they end up um in this situation where basically you've got no muscle mass generally overweight low bone mineral density and then one fall is the difference between uh being independent and, and ending up in hospital and or a nursing home and it's one of the leading causes of death is uh like it's got such a high mortality rate uh once you've had a fall and broken hip you're very likely to die within the year so the like for longevity using like injury as an opportunity to focus on something else get better at something you've not done before i think is the the best thing i can do because i just remember this one lady sheila who is 93 years old uh she'd sit there she'd be playing words with friends uh on her ipad with her son and random people on the internet and like so with it 93 years old um but then just could not stand up because she didn't have the muscle mass in her um legs to support her weight and it's just like if you'd just done something consistently <laughs> for your life like you'd be out there and you'd be like loving life and and it, she was in this hospital because you've just not done anything with your body for so long and as i said your body gets used to it adapts to what you spend your time doing so if you do nothing um which is so often what happens when people get injured then your body will adapt to that you'll get weaker your muscle mass will decrease your bone mineral density will decrease um and when you then try and get back into doing um an activity or a sport your capacity will be lower so when you try and do what you used to be able to do you'll then exceed your capacity again cause another injury and then you're on this downward spiral and these downward spirals are so unfortunate because when you as like i've seen with your coaching like you have a very much a holistic approach of working with people's mindset working with their sleep working with their um, nutrition and there's i'm sure most people have experienced this like when you're training well it means you're probably tired by the end of the day. You get some like good quality sleep and an appropriate time. 
you feel motivated to eat well and it's this nice positive spiral but when we get injured and you're like oh you know can't do the exercise you end up staying up late finding other things to entertain yourself binge watching a series eating crap getting to sleep late <laughs> Um, and then it just becomes this, this downward spiral where your body is is basically atrophying, not becoming um, as uh, resilient, your capacity is decreasing. So then it just becomes harder and harder to get back to um, doing what you used to be able to do. So if you can try and like stop that negative spiral by, if you get an injury, be like, okay, I've got the shoulder injury. Um, what's What can I do with my lower body um, that will keep me engaged, keep me excited about um, training, excited about moving? Um, and it doesn't need to be exactly related to what you usually do. I think sometimes what I've really loved since um, like playing one sport intensely for 11 years, I love sucking at new sports. It's just so satisfying because you just get such tangible improvement every time you try. And I just like, I could not swim. I'd get 50 meters and just die. Um, but like I did a learn to ocean swim course with my mom who was 65 and just getting, getting into exercise the first time in her life. Um, and it was just so satisfying because I was so bad at it. And every time I turned up, I was like, I know I'm going to get better at this. And I think when people can take that approach of being like a grateful beginner and like really diving into and appreciating just how like much you can improve on the things that you're worst at, um, I find that to be really helpful for myself when I've had injuries and, and yeah, certainly like helpful for my patients to keep them engaged, keep them, um, that positive health spiral going and, um, yeah, and just one kind of anecdote on this, uh, where this really was cemented into me was when, when I was training with Sebastian Oreb, um, the powerlifter, and uh, I'd torn my hammy. can't remember how. Just torn my hammy. Um, sprinting, something. Anyway, he was like, great, we'll do a four-day-a-week bench press program with you. And I was like, mate, that will kill me. <laughs> and I was like, I'd, I'd, I'd had like a, a labral tear in my shoulder from an ultimate frisbee injury where someone had barged into me and... Um, the labrum is basically the cartilage in your um, shoulder joint that holds the like adds kind of passive support to the ball in the socket and that had been something that is like just ached forever and would be pretty painful if i tried to use my my shoulders too much and i was like mate you're you're crazy but i was like okay i'll trust you and um yeah so we basically did this like um it was like a eastern european squat insane split thing uh but adapted for um doing a bench press and so it was comp style um powerlifting bench press and then we do a combinate with um, a balanced program like having uh pushing and pulling as an even sort of split plus external rotation to balance out the internal rotators of your shoulder as well um so it was but it was four days a week like never maxing out but certainly challenging every day um and by the six weeks by the time the six weeks had finished hammy was better and I'd put on like 25 kilos on my bench press. And it was the first time since I think I'd had that shoulder injury for about four years that I had no pain in my shoulder because I'd built up so much muscular strength that the passive support structures of my shoulder didn't have to do as much work. And it was just such a good example of like, oh, I could have spent this last six weeks just like tapped out and <laughs> been like, I'll come back to training um, later. But if I'd done that, like <laughs> I would have been, you know, weak, slow, unfit, and my shoulder was would still feel like shit so um yeah it was just a very in, like informative experience that has really um yeah uh, impacted how i instruct my own patients mate that was absolute gold <laughs> like everything <laughs> that you said there there's so many points that i just want to double click on the um the downward spiral so definitely when people get hurt and it's kind of what you were talking about about not like focusing on staying strong or working around stuff because then you hurt your shoulder or your hip or whatever then you might try and rehab your hurt it again and you're like oh i'm just going to avoid exercise now because i keep getting hurt and then you get weaker you get more compromised you become an even higher injury risk going forwards and then what you said around falls, I think that's a super interesting point as well. And it's something that I really saw firsthand. I, I lived in Asia for two years, in my mid twenties. And um, I was like, Jesus, people move so well here. Like I was in India and in Thailand and I was like, you know, 70, 80 year old people squatting, you know, perfect squat, sitting cross-legged on the ground, you know, getting into Lotus, no problem. And I was getting into yoga then as well. And I was sitting on the ground and I, like literally after 30 seconds in 
huge pain like my knees are going to explode my hips are going to explode and then all these people like twice my age three times my age are just like sitting no problem and it's just because they never stop you know they go from being kids to just doing it daily you know as their kind of daily yeah. behavior I've, I've said it a few times in this podcast already and i say it constantly <laughs> in my my job is that your body adapts to what you spend your time doing and so if you yeah these people who've been doing it their whole life and that's just what they do then your body is amazing like it does adapt to um support your structures to be able to yeah handle the stimulus that you give it so yeah and then what you said about like just changing your mindset or approach like that kind of growth mindset trying new activities and embracing embracing the soft like that's one from gmb <laughs> which i think is a really good term and there's another one around like the first 20 hours from i can't remember who it is who the guy's name mm. is but he wrote a book about the first 20 hours basically to become competent at something so the 10,000 hours is mastery 20 hours to competency so just understanding that you're going to be terrible at something if you haven't done it before but just staying with yeah. it and going through that discomfort you're going to improve and get better at it so yeah and it yeah. just leads you to places that you don't always expect and i think you can't always trust yourself as knowing what's best for you and sometimes just trying something else out and doing kind of unexpected things can just lead you to such good places like i always had really made an identity about the fact that i was a terrible swimmer i was a land person and a land athlete and um yeah did this ocean swimming course end up absolutely falling in love with it decided to um i was doing it six days a week i ended up moving to the place like manly in in sydney where um there's an amazing amazing um place to ocean swim where you see all sorts of amazing wildlife and fish and whatever and like met a great community there end up meeting uh, my now fiance there um and i live here now and like i just did a half iron man triathlon like <laughs> things that i just never thought i'd be able to do and it was from just trying like being open-minded about doing something a little bit different when you you know when your plan doesn't go as pla like you don't do what you want to do so you try something else and you just go with it and you, you just don't know when you end up so yeah i don't know how helpful that is but i think um super helpful, yeah, it's yeah yeah not getting too caught up in that identity of like oh i'm this person i'm not that person so i won't won't ever try this yeah just try things out it's great <laughs> yeah yeah and it's if you're bad at something that's normal it's normal to be bad at something you haven't done before. yeah i just there was another um quick piece that i want to talk about which was related to the um, pain science side of thing and also um, to continue training while focusing on um, something else that isn't your injury is like often with pain and I, I really see this a lot with kind of high achieving athlete type people who when their injury is such a big threat to their identity as an athlete um, as I said like pain is perceived threat and when you're an athlete and your injury kind of takes like is so wrapped up in your sense of self, um, I've really found often that's the hardest patient to deal with because they're so focused on their injury, so focused on their pain that every time they do any movement, it's like you've got um, a computer screen in front of you and the whole screen is taken up by like them zooming into that, um, that piece of that painful uh, lower back while they do an exercise. And so like it's just taking up the whole thing. It's all they can think about. And every time they do the movement, like it's just, it's such a large part of their brain. And so with kind of my approach with rehab is and trying to get people to do other things and, and have a more generalized approach to, um, uh, to exercise is basically trying to shrink that, that browser window of <laughs> their focus on that bit of pain and just make it take up less and less of the screen so they can focus and do other things instead of it um, taking over everything. And then, almost making them like listen to their body less <laughs> because um, when, when pain is perceived threat and your identity is wrapped up in, <laughs> um, you know, that injury, it can just become all encompassing. And then people like, it really affects people mentally and they're often the ones who will spiral the most. So by doing a, like a generalized pro a more generalized program where you can focus on other things, um, treating injury as opportunity, you basically shrink and then eventually minimize this window of that injury. And it, doesn't impact your life anymore so um that's just a, a way i kind of like to think about um an analogy that i like to think about for um that pain and identity yeah that's super helpful mate i'm like just when you just said that i was like shit that's me <laughs> that was me when yeah i, I know i can back. tell <laughs> <laughs> like but yeah it's often people like you and me who like we're so interested and engaged and like really want to figure it out 
that that ends up becoming unhelpful because you've just created this context and like your thoughts, moods, and beliefs are so like on overdrive that you just you're listening to your body too much. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I've and been like there too. Your livelihood, you're like, oh, I can't yeah. work now. This is really scary. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's really helpful, man. I appreciate that. Let's talk a bit more about your 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 businesses. Like you're doing a lot of different things. Um, and I guess maybe what's your day to day routine? Like, how do you fit everything in? I know before we started, you were saying you're going, you know, doing less, but more like less, but deeper on stuff. But do you want to maybe yeah. talk about what you do? You're doing adapt physio, which is your own thing with, with a partner, right? Yeah, I did have a business partner. He's um, someone I met when I was working at the Giants AFL club, which was something I was doing um, as well when I was doing massage and sports trainer, sports trainer being, you know, the water boy. It's pretty fun. But mate, as a water boy in AFL, and you also do on field first aid and stuff, but as a water boy, I was clocking 11 kilometers per game on some of those games. Wow. We're running out, running water, crazy. So th- yeah, those athletes, they're amazing. Um, but yeah, so I had a business partner who he was with the Giants for, for 10 seasons, and now he's been picked up by the Newcastle Knights in the NRL, so rugby league. Uh, so he's moved away. So it's just um, myself again in my in the clinic, in the, in the gym. Um, so yeah, basically like I, I'm still, as I, as I said before, we had unity gym used to be the gym where I worked and now they've moved entirely online. So I'm still somewhat involved with, uh, their online community and, um, we, we, we've done a bunch of podcasts together. Um, and I still turn up on their, um, online stuff once a, a week because I really love online physio. And I think we'll talk a bit about, um, online physio and, kind of yeah some pros and cons about it but so i do have like an online component to um my work and then i also um am in the gym and instead of just doing kind of conventional like physio treatments i also have sort of physio supervised like personal training um with some of my patients like like this one guy who's just uh he's my favorite just so impressive with his kind of transformation over the last um three years he's lost 45 kilos not not with me as his trainer but he kind of came in um, and he was just like a whirlwind of um, stress about like his knee was sore and his back was sore. And but we sort of end up taking zooming out a bit and realized that he was just completely exercise addicted because he had lost so much weight. And then he was terrified about not training high intensity every day. He was terrified about eating at a like calorie maintenance. <laughs> and he was not getting any sleep because he was like working really hard as well. And it's been a really great journey over the um, last sort of six months of working with him and doing like trying to do it more like lifestyle holistic sort of stuff. And now we're doing um, like, I've just did a swimming lesson with him the other day and uh, doing outdoor running sessions and that side of things. So yeah, in my clinic, I really do love that approach of, I guess it's, I don't know, sometimes I think I maybe should have uh, simplified things and been a personal trainer um, because I, I just really love that. Like you guys ha- kind of have that freedom to do more of the lifestyle stuff. And often physios get a bit pigeonholed into like only acute injuries always. And um, yeah, but I've really tried to uh, move out from that a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, with my with my clinic, um, again, as I said, I kind of made the mistake at the beginning of trying to get too much information and not enough action. Um, so I've recently started a, um, a physio accountability group, which is an online Facebook group where it tries to incentivize um, the action um, and, then is a, and then is a place for information as well. I'm actually just starting a daily podcast to Sorry there. to just 10 interrupt, minutes. Phil, but the, the physio accountability group, that's for people who are injured or for other physios? Well, uh, for people who are injured or have niggles when they're, um, when they're doing their sport or activity, um, this idea came to me, as I said, like with my experience of running that marathon and being having 21 long kilometers to go in a lot of pain, being like, how do I get people to actually do the things, including me? Like, how do I get myself to actually do those little things day after day? Because there are so many people... I think who have all the motivation in the world to do a hard training session. Like I was doing this, this marathon program where I was running six days a week. Every session was over an hour. And like, you know, this was when Sydney was having terrible floods. I'd get up in the dark and I'd run over an hour and then I wouldn't spend 10 minutes like doing some simple rehab stuff. I'm like, what is wrong with me? (laughs) I I know (laughs) like how is there that disconnect? But when you don't have kind of these like habits and systems in place to actually do those things, just like gets away from you and then you spent like all this time and then you end up just being excruciating pain as i'm on this marathon being like if i just done a little bit consistently um then i could have been a whole lot of uh, in a better place and um 
And yeah, with that physio business model, which I've been trying to figure out what the most ethical and effective way of helping people is like, I think with that place that was doing the eight session KPIs, like they build in accountability by getting you to come back and supervising you doing those things. And, you know, you've got a financial buy-in to turning up, knowing that someone's like checking on you. I was like, well, if I can create that with a Facebook group where you get incentivized instead of the stick, you're getting the carrot of um, each post of doing um, the exercise is a raffle ticket that goes then towards a weekly draw of treatments in the gym or online um, online sessions. Then hopefully that's just that enough. And then there's a community aspect of um, encouraging each other and <laughs> seeing other people doing what you know you should be doing um, to then try and incentivize action. So I've just launched that in the last um, uh, week or two. So that's been a fun little um, a little project. And um, and yeah, then I'm also uh, heavily involved in another business, which is called the Physio Accelerator, uh, which is with a mentor. Because as I said, I, I started at looking at different clinics to work at, and then I decided to go it alone with the Unity guys um, working out of their gym. But I realized that um, learning from other physios and not just getting into my own little echo chamber uh, was really important. So I was presenting some research that I did as part of my doctor of physiotherapy degree at the Sports Medicine Australia conference. And um, there was a physio presenting there as the main keynote speaker for the um, three-day conference. Um, so she was like the headline act. And uh, her name is Trish Wisby Roth. Uh, and she's been an Olympian physio for the last 30 years, a specialist physio and um, just one of the kind of big dogs in <laughs> um, Australian physio. And what I loved about her talk was it was all about how to build a career that you love. And I think there's so much kind of pressure and kind of, uh, yeah, I think just like so much pressure as a physio, like that you always should be learning more and you should always should be like studying, studying, studying. And I think you've kind of got a bit of that with like, <laughs> you know, you've done so many courses and you're constantly like, how do I get better at this? How do I get better at this? And then you end up just like, spending so much money and so much time and so much stress of like not feeling like you're you, you know enough to help people yet <laughs> yeah. that you can like get that kind of imposter syndrome and that you end up like limiting the way, amount you can help people because you're sort of following that path so intensely so i think there's a lot of that in physiotherapy and i really love that she sort of her whole presentation was like how to actually build a career that you love and like how to use the skills that you have to to really help people and so i end up um sliding into her dms on on twitter <laughs> afterwards and uh <laughs> and just was saying like that i you know really loved and appreciated that it was kind of the right message at the right time for me as i was starting my career and uh i tried to look up what she did online but her web presence was absolutely terrible um but anyway she told me they had a, a full year mentoring program where you could pay a bunch of money um to do in person and online uh, uh sort of mentoring education sessions and um as I did that for the next year, I, I got to know her pretty well and um, I'd be the annoying person asking lots of questions and, um, you know, we got got chatting a lot and with the Unity guys being quite successful with their online um, business, they were really intrigued. The fact that like, you know, here I was this um, new graduate or early career physio, like on podcasts and <laughs> doing this stuff and like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> um, this is new and different. And so I ended up uh, getting kind of closer with um Trish and her husband who ran the business and um, we did a bit of a rebrand and a relaunch. And um, so the idea with that physio group is, um, or that physio business is there's education there, but I've also made a, um, like we have a Facebook group where it's again, trying to incentivize small actions of personal develop, like professional development, um, but also trying to create like a virtual staff room where um, physios who can often feel pretty um, isolated, like can, work together do case studies together and um have that sort of community support which i think particularly over like the last couple of years of not being able to go to conferences and not being able to <laughs> do things in person so much um has been great yeah that's awesome mate really really good to hear that and uh it's just really cool to see you've um you've kind of sought out experts to improve yourself and then of course it's just benefited you from uh like a business point of view as well like a knowledge base it's just really really good to see like you don't have any issues with i guess putting yourself out there which i think is a really important thing probably linked as well yeah, to and what like, I trying new things with sports it's all kind of related right yeah and it's been fantastic having trish she like she's such a wonderful lady like so kind and generous with her time but she's also like very old school physio which 
I, you know, from my kind of development through the career has been, <laughs> I don't know, the opposite of that, I guess. And so it is really nice to have it sort of have that like anchoring in like kind of more conventional physio and and seeing, you know, that there's so much, it, it's easy. I think, again, coming back to that identity idea of being like, oh yeah, you know, all old school people are this and I'm, I'm different to that. But, you know, as with life, it is all about, you know, trying to take the good parts, get what you, you know, see what is helpful, appreciate and respect like the, the really useful, um, you know, parts of someone who is different to you and then um, trying to incorporate that into a more well-rounded um, approach. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Let, let's actually kind of go into that in a bit more detail around maybe something you've changed your mind on recently, recently being maybe the last one to two years or maybe six to 12 mm. months. Yeah, I think um, one of the big ones was, like, my, as I said, my background was like a decade of massage up until now. So I've done a lot of remedial massage and it's been such a nice career because people leave and they're like, they're stoked. They're, they feel really great. They're like, oh my God, <laughs> I feel so much better. Um, and it's a really nice job for me because, you know, I like people are um, you know, feeling good when they leave and I really like chatting to people as you can probably tell um so having someone locked in a room who can't get anywhere else um to to chat to me is is kind of nice no I, I let people chill out if they want um but since becoming a physio and having my sort of way of treating um being very much about more on the education side of things and more on the um you know active approach getting your programming right getting your technique right like that very active approach so in when looking at kind of health care practitioners, you sort of think of like passive approaches versus active. So passive when someone's doing something to you, whether that's massage or needling or some funky technique or whatever. So like there's kind of almost, as I said, with my, my mentor, there's almost that, like that old school, new school, like, you know, if you do passive modalities and you're <laughs> like you're old school. Um, but I think it's been a really nice um, realization that I don't need to throw out all of that. And I was trying so hard with my physio patients to basically not touch massage and almost like, like almost pretend I didn't do it <laughs> as like, because I wanted people to take control of their own health and, and not need me and be, you know, totally self-sufficient with just knowledge. But I think becoming a bit more nuanced around that and realizing that sometimes people just get so much out of that initial feeling like their pain can be changed and that there is like, you know, there are physical things that <laughs> they can do for themselves that, that might have a, an effect. So doing some muscle release at the front, um, you know, might mean that getting engaged with more strengthening um, through the muscles in their back and a bit more mobility at the front will, will be helpful. So just being a bit more nuanced about like bringing in that, that skill that I have um, and not being a like new school physio purist, I guess. <laughs> so that's probably the biggest change in the last year, particularly. Totally, mate. Like just having the right, using the right tool at the right time for the right person, right? Yeah. Now, well, just one thing that I, you mightn't have any knowledge about this, but do you have any, you know, any information or do you know anything about trauma being locked in the body or anything in, in that arena? Or did you study anything around that? Yeah, not specifically, but it is certainly something that I've come across with plenty of patients over the years who hold that belief and while like there's been i don't know different patients have had different wording around it but i think where it's and i know there was i did get recommended a book recently from a patient who was Michael talking Vander specifically because body keeps a score from, yes yeah yeah, yeah 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 that's the one yeah. <laughs> and so that is on my reading list yeah. um but i think where hopefully what I've talked about so far with pain science and um, kind of your thoughts, moods, belief, and your context playing a role in your pain experience. I think there's a lot there that makes sense to me that um, people's pain experiences are very much influenced by, um, you know, their, their context, um, their context. And there's nothing that builds identity and context more than, than trauma for a lot of people I know. So um, yeah, I do. I don't, again, I don't have like a, a specific, um, training or, on like area of interest in, in trauma, but I do see how it would be very much linked via that pain science, um, direction. Yeah. 
very interesting yeah it's, it's a really good book strongly recommend it uh, yeah no i'd love to I, I yeah it's been definitely on the list <laughs> yeah cool mate so let's go through maybe one to three people that who've been most influential to you your career or to how you think about things to date yeah i think um that experience of going into unity gym after yanni was like no really gyms can be cool like <laughs> that was an influential conversation because uh, i was so against that idea at first like i just sort of thought i'm not a gym person this isn't for me um up until then and that was kind of one of the beginnings of like oh maybe i shouldn't trust myself all the time and maybe i should try out new things <laughs> because mm. that ended up being such a fundamentally like life-changing thing to go start training that gym um, getting to know those guys and obviously end up working um, in their gym and now with them online. And then also um, through that, you know, meeting um, all of the people that I've met through my career. So um, yeah, definitely them, definitely um, Sebastian Oreb with training under him was such a interesting and eye-opening experience and, you know, seeing kind of the caliber of athletes that he was training where, you know, I got up to doing like three reps at 180 for three reps at like, uh, three sets at, you know, I was probably 85 kilos or something at the time. But then there'd be people in the gym who are literally lifting double that weight. <laughs> like, you know, so like training in a in an area like that where you just sort of realize just how you, how the body is just amazing. Like if you train it to do something specifically, like, like the said principle of specific adaptation to impose demand, like if you do one thing enough, like you get really good at it. <laughs> and um, sort of seeing, seeing that, um, area of specificity was just so fascinating and particularly at the same time because i was working I, my two main niches in my massage career at that time was powerlifters and ultra marathon runners and so just the absolute opposite ends of the spectrum of specificity and um one of the guys scotty hawker who's um a really like a top professional um, ultra marathon runner from um, new zealand he was pretty much the same age same height um as sebastian Oreb, but he weighed 50 kilos less um, and he, you know, he had run um, ultra marathon run. Like his favorite event was ultra trail Mont Blanc, where you're running up and down Mont Blanc in France, like at altitude, and like just so cool to see. Like they were both kind of, you know, looked would have looked pretty similar in high school, and then they just did something different with their body enough to be the absolute like pinnacle of their their sports, but at such opposite ends of the spectrum. So, um, yeah, I think so. So for three people, I'd say. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely Yanni and um and and Rad, um. But yeah, Bass and training with him was fascinating. But there's actually another patient of mine um who was on that ultra marathon niche, um Jess Baker. She's just one of the most amazing people I've ever met. Uh, British lass who'd moved out to Australia, joined a running group, um, just to meet people. And then the next time she ran in the UK was running uh, for Great Britain in the 24 hour running world championships. Um, where she just realized that, you know, she's pretty good at running and can keep doing it and <laughs> doing it again and again and again. And um, yeah, she's just a, just one of those people we like just ultra marathon runners are some of the most interesting people because like the elite ones, like the really good ones, they're usually like a type intense personalities, but the ultra elite, like the professionals, they're just the most Zen amazing like people because with um, ultra marathon running, like it's, getting the fitness is easy enough. Like you don't have to be that fit to run at the pace that they do, but to be able to be injury resilient enough to last for the distances and the time that they last, but then mentally tough enough to be able to <laughs> um, get through it is just something else. And, and Jess and, and, and Scotty as well, like they really like were people who were just so wonderfully positive and open and you could just see that they'd be comfortable in their brains for long enough to, <laughs> to last through the, the challenging distances. And, um, and one of the reasons like why I just, had so much respect and, and um, appreciation for Jess was, um, you know, in the current state of like Instagram fitness where it's so much about like you do things just to get it on the gram and, um, you know, every every event has a like a charity sponsorship of uh, like attached to it or a brand sponsoring it or like there's always some sort of external reason to do like that the athletes are getting or the Instagram people are getting kind of reimbursed and i totally understand it like people need to make a living but like jess ran across iceland like she ran from the north to the south of iceland with her friend for fun <laughs> like that's 570 k's completely self-sustainable like sustained no one helped them just the two of them ran they ran like a couple hundred like 150 odd k to get to um 
this spot where then it turned into dense forest or dense wilderness for the next 300 k's. So they had a bit of a nap and then they didn't sleep again for the next 300 k's because they'd have to carry too much food if they did. And then they got to the other end, like got to the end of that wilderness, got some food, had a nap, ran the last bit, got to the lighthouse, took one photo, and then a storm was setting in. So then they ran another marathon to get back to a town to hire a car and fly back to Australia. And like, <laughs> I just like could not believe. They could have but met so many that. reels if they wanted. <laughs> yeah, right. So many reels, exactly. <laughs> um, but just that, like, just doing it for the love of it and just showing how amazing the body is to go from someone who is, you know, not a, someone who's been running their whole life, just someone who loves experiencing their body and, and testing it. And, you know, she would have had some niggles, but not having, like, not being held back by injuries or whatever along the way, just like sticking with her craft. And, and you know, she was doing crazy things like on, after work on a Tuesday would get a train out to the mountains and then run overnight and then get a train back to work the next morning like oh, she's obviously like off and like running through i mean there was like bushfires at the time and like they end up having to run down this river because everything else was on fire and they turned up next to the fireys who were like what are you doing <laughs> um anyway so i think yeah she's right up there in terms of people who are just like i think people who take that who just have so much appreciation for their body and for their health and their their fitness and they really make the most of that and i'm not saying you have to do um absolutely insane uh feats of physical endurance but i think it's just that like you know the body is so much hardier like it's so much stronger and more capable than i think a lot of people get give it credit for and i know that like plenty of my mates and, and i had this as well in my like kind of mid to early 20s before i'd sort of got strength and conditioning kind of right was just feeling like you know, I, I was disqualified from doing, you know, hard exercise or, or doing certain things because of injury. And I just love seeing, yeah, people like that who just, yeah, stick with it and do incredible things to their body and, and their mind. Yeah, so. mate. That's amazing. It's a different type of human being, I think, who can do that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. It's just like completely different level. Uh, yeah cool. but what's, what i love about it is she is also just family. she's so normal like she's the most normal person you've ever met and like she doesn't look like a super athlete she's like such a humble lovely person so i think there is just like there is something inside probably all of us that like could access that but it's just um yeah part of it is like your identity and your belief about what you're capable of doing so yeah well well said let's go into some rapid fire to finish off mate so mm -hmm. if you could have dinner with anyone in the world that you'd like to just pick their brain for two or three hours, who would it be and why? Uh, currently my, I mean, this is going to sound really lame, but my fiance is living in a different city. And at the moment, uh, spoil, so exciting news, she's pregnant. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> and Very so good. at the moment I'm having dinner every night with the uh, ultrasound photos of um, our future child. And so yeah. like at the moment, I just really, yeah, would love to have dinner with her, but I will have a less uh, sappy answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, hard to say, like in the, like, cause in the physical sort of realms, like I've just been so lucky over the years to have, uh, yeah, these incredible athletes as patients where I've, I've had that privilege of being in the room with them for an hour. So like in the, both in the strength kind of realms and the, and the endurance, um, realms and, and professional sports. So I've kind of had the, like fortunate enough to talk to, um, some of the, and pick the brains for hours of, of some of the most amazing athletes I can think of. But um, yeah, I guess from the, maybe something more on the, oh, actually something that I'm really bad at. And, and this is part of why I started that accountability group is like, yeah, getting effective habits in place and getting those actions in place. And so I think if I was to try and make the most of my time and get dinner with someone who would be able to most impact and help me with both my own personal like stresses around like getting things done productivity and also helping my patients. Um, yeah, probably James clear who wrote atomic habits. Um, <laughs> and just being like, all right, you know, I've read your book a million times now. How do I, <laughs> how do I do it? <laughs> so yeah, seems like an interesting guy probably wouldn't talk about baseball much, but, um, as he loves to talk about, but, uh, yeah, yeah I'd love to pick his brain and, and yeah, get that down. Yeah. So I think as a physio and as a coach, like being able to, educate people into yeah those effective actions is is one of the the biggest things you could do for someone yeah yeah he's a super interesting guy he's super disciplined as well he wrote like a newsletter 
two twice a week i think it was mondays and thursdays for like nine years something crazy yeah like never never missed a week and then obviously i know wrote like, a beast of a book as well yeah like hook that to my brain like i want to be able to do that and i loved and you know i guess when i was with the unity guys they he i think yanni spent like eighty thousand dollars on turning one of the offices like one of the spaces in the gym into a podcast studio which was soundproofed and incredible microphones and incredible computer and cameras and everything and then it it made the habit of doing these daily episodes that we used to do so easy and um <laughs> i think like you know that like the lessons i've learned from um james clear's book as well is is all about you know how do you make it easy how do you make it appealing and i think uh that experience of doing those daily podcasts with um uh with the unity guys was uh yeah a wonderful <laughs> Uh, highlight of probably what I enjoy the most about my um, career is trying to help people with that in- information. So, yeah, but definitely that was a bit of a tangent, but yeah, James Clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just on that as well, like the amount of content that the guys put out is pretty amazing. You know, they're really super disciplined guys as well, the Unity guys. Mm. Yeah. And um, that's now what I'm with this accountability group. My aim is, to, as I said before, just to do like a even just like a 10 minute daily um, thing of all the things that I wish my patients knew um, and having, yeah, done, I think we did oh, over 300 and something episodes um, with the unity guys got very, yeah, I loved that, that process and that, um, that habit. So looking to instill that in myself a bit. And I think, you know, that, that idea of you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with is, is very true. And I think having had the privilege of spending so much time with like Yanni is just a powerhouse of productivity and, <laughs> getting shit done and um yeah i do miss not having him in the in the same building that i work in anymore but luckily we're still in contact <laughs> yeah yeah for sure any uh, advice around like this is completely selfish question but like advice around how you guys came up with information content to talk about every day for like a year a year <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah um great question I was also, when Yanni was telling me about his idea, I was like, you are insane. What are we going to do? Just like, <laughs> sitting there staring at each other across the, the big table. Not, that nice we got. weather today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I think, um, and this is something that over that time um, I sort of developed with my own uh, thinking about treatments is, is thinking about this um, basically like a hierarchy of needs for your treatment or your patients or like your coaching service like what are the fundamental things that people definitely 100 percent need to know and think of that as the bottom of the pyramid and then go into as much detail and having like frameworks like if you've read any of the russell brunson books like the expert secrets have you read that i haven't but I, I, so he's a, a click funnels guy right yeah he's a click funnels guy so he's got dot com secrets expert secrets and then um traffic secrets but his expert secrets is all about how do you build a framework around what you do oh my camera is just um i think giving up on me here but you still got sound um sound still good yeah perfect cool um yeah so it's it's all about like you don't want to be you want to basically have infinite depth on each of your topics that you can go into so like if you think about everything that you like hierarchy of needs for your patients and like or your your clients everything that you wish they know and then having like a dot point of that and then sort of thinking of like what are the sub points of each of those things so you have a framework that's really useful from a um like a looking at it all at once in in sentences but then also um if you need to dive deeper into any one of those points then what would be the sub um points of each of those and so we basically did that and yanni ended up printing out this like a mega document of a, a nine-week rolling series of um those fundamental um, topics that we talk about and then we just look at you know each episode going into a new layer of depth on them um, to yeah keep the content fresh and you know after a while of doing like that same nine week rolling <laughs> thing after a while we we're like whoa did we talk about this yesterday <laughs> like it did get a bit um, feeling like you're repeating yourself but I think there is such a uh, obsession with novelty in like this current state of the world and information where we always feel like we need to be getting something new and we need to be implementing something new and i know i totally got addicted to always trying to find a new podcast or a new audiobook and getting through it as quickly as possible so i could jump onto the next one and um getting that knowledge and then getting onto the next one and getting that knowledge but what i've started doing now with audiobooks is listening to the same one you know two three four times and actually trying to implement the stuff because <laughs> like i think 
as professionals, we often get worried that we are repeating the same things. But if you're repeating the same valuable things to get them to <laughs> actually implement on that, then um, that's so much more valuable for the person than trying to constantly excite them with shiny objects. Great point, mate. Yeah, and I think that's the kind of difficult thing as a online coach or content creator as well. Like, you're going to be repeating yourself a lot, but if you're repeating fundamentals that are really effective and helpful, then people can't hear that stuff enough anyway. Yeah, and people learn in different ways. Like, some people um, like analogies. Some people like scientific explanation of things. Some people, um, you know, with coaching, like visual feedback. Other people like proprioceptive feedback or tactile feedback. Like, there are so many different ways which people learn. It's been really informative having coached so many people now where it's like, I swear that worked with the last person, but this person is not even close to understanding what's going on here. And you and you give that same message in a slightly different way and it, it, it clicks. And so that's what, um, yeah, we've really tried to do is basically like, how can we give this information in different ways, whether it's like stories of, you know, crazy athletes doing crazy things or going into the science and talking about how, um, you know, the, the research got to where it is around that subject. And um, yeah, so I think backing yourself that it's like no useful, like fundamental useful information on repeat is valuable (laughs) and i think that's been like really noticeable since i'm talking to some physios who are very like i I started doing a day a week at a clinic down south where my partner was working um during covid um it's a couple hours away and the guy was like what you do a daily podcast like you know you're so early in your career you don't know anything i was like well i know that people should probably train somewhat frequently and that they should take like progressive overload principles into account and (laughs) like These, you know, I might not have like 10,000 hours of experience doing this one particular type of, you know, I don't know, ankle taping, but like that doesn't disqualify me from giving someone really good fundamental information for them to implement. So I think kind of backing yourself into knowing like what makes the biggest difference for you and your patients or clients and then, um, yeah, delivering that in different levels of depth in different levels of way in different ways. Yeah, exactly. And you can always, uh, I can't believe he, did he actually say that to you? You don't know enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, like, because wow. he's, he's got, he owns like six physio businesses, one of the biggest, um, uh, my camera is really not working here. Um, yeah, he, he owns lots of businesses. He employs so many new grads and he has a full-time employee who's just like a clinical educator. And he's basically, you know, just like takes that approach of new grads are idiots, don't like and that's okay that's totally okay to be not know what you're doing at first but you don't like you can't say anything until you've put in the time and that's i just think that approach really um underserves uh, (laughs) like doesn't yeah so well that's the thing because there's people going to be out there shouting about ridiculous stuff like who are just not qualified at all and they're just going to be loud and it's i think it's a duty and it's definitely information to people and it's it's something that was actually brought up in my physio degree of like there's so much restriction around health practitioners and what we can and can't say because you know we've got have that evidence-based practice and um and so they kind of like almost put the fear of god in you of like giving any advice because you might get sued for it and have your license like taken away um and meanwhile for someone who's a personal trainer like they can go on the internet and say anything and that's fine like (laughs) and you know that's a point of stress and you know why i always tried to get the guys to put in disclaimers about what i was saying and you know you're not a I've, I've like this you isn't a physio consult many times on the podcast oh, mate, like, oh, because it's let's uh let's just be clear about this <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly um so it's uh, just an unfortunate reality of like the, the type of professional qualification that i have but like i think it it is a shame because you know you like physios do have so much good information that they like if they were sharing it instead of maybe someone who was off the deep end with like <laughs> some uh, things that maybe aren't uh, helpful for people. I'm trying to say this in the nicest way <laughs> possible, but like instead of just like constant bullshit being thrown out there, like if you did have more good information, then I think people would have a better like understanding of health literacy and would be able to look after themselves better. But we feel so like shackled by the possibility of getting sued. <laughs> yeah, totally, mate. It's actually Dale. I can't remember Dale or how to pronounce Dale's his second name, but he's uh, he's a physio and a PT based in Melbourne. We're in the same online, like online mentoring program, and he he kind of 
deals we were kind of dealing with similar niches online from a personal training perspective but he's saying like his messaging is he can't say the things that i say so because he's a physio even if he's just yeah. practicing as a as a pt which i, I know even trying to give that. like simple nutrition advice around like you know like basic stuff and you know even with my sports science degree like i have to be so careful about like staying in that kind of scope of practice and it does get yeah it is challenging <laughs> but yeah. anyway that's okay all right mate last two questions first one is book or books maybe something rehab or training or even mm. pain science related and then maybe fiction or something else yeah um i think going back to that james clear example like that book atomic habits it's just so infinitely applicable to anything in your life and i think um yeah from a like physio perspective um i do think it is those like those little things done consistently that have the biggest effect on your training and overall health so i think that practical application like use, reading that book with the thought of how do i apply this to creating the the body that is capable of doing the thing that i want it to do um is is really useful um so i know i'm kind of double dipping on the answers there but you didn't give me time to prepare so you're gonna have to uh, <laughs> deal with that um yeah i think um from the pain science side of things like if you are really like if people are interested in this then um the book explain pain by laura mosley is sort of the go-to recommendation there um otherwise jump on youtube and check out um uh his videos laura mosley um how i think there's one thing white, or how do you spell uh, it, the name l-o-r-i-m-e-r and then mosley m-o-s-e l-e-y i think um and i think he's got a video called why things hurt that was really popular um which does a great job in explaining uh like an overview of, of pain science so i think that one would be um yeah probably my top recommendation great last question if you could put something on a billboard or somewhere that millions and not billions of people could see it what would you write and why mm. yeah i think um like I think what I've said a few times, like that your body adapts to what you spend your time doing, I think is something that if everyone could ingrain that, then they'd like, because most injuries happen because people do something like they do too much too soon. They exceed their capacity to handle load and then they get an injury. Like, you know, there's occasional instances like, you you know, you might uh, have a sporting injury where someone tackles you and you can't help but you know, that gets injured. But most people, particularly probably in your environment where it is people in, uh, doing like in the gym or running or rock climbing or things like that, where you're not having these likely um, traumatic injuries, it usually is just a, an issue in managing load effectively and doing more than your body's capable of doing too quickly. So I think that that your body adapts to what you spend t- your time doing both gives you an exercise prescription because you're like, okay, I've got to gradually do more of the thing that I want to be able to do. Um, but it also kind of catches people and realize that like, ah, oh, what have I done for the last three months? Mm spent plenty of time at my desk, <laughs> lots of time working, <laughs> uh, you know, sitting in the car a lot, getting home, being exhausted, sitting on the couch. And like that, when you think about your body in that context, you're like, okay, well, I'm very much adapted to sitting down and sitting on the couch. And therefore, if I want to do something new, I shouldn't just get that like, um, I don't know, David Goggins, like bust yourself, like, you know, 75 days hard, do like, two days of sessions, uh, uh, two days, like two sessions a day. Um, yeah. If your body hasn't been prepared to do that, like taking a gradual approach where you consistently build towards what you want to be able to do, um, that would be, yeah, the exercise prescription from <laughs> that one simple phrase. Yeah, that's a really, just really great advice, mate. And that's a really good way to finish today. So before I let you go, where can we send people to learn more about you, what you do, uh, where to find your podcast, all these things? Yeah, just before I do, I do want to add one bit of a caveat there. Um, when I say like, you know, the Debbie Golding slash 75 days hard, like people sometimes do need that point of extreme motivation and extreme action to get them into something. So I totally understand where why those things you know are really effective in motivating people but i just yeah hope that people like try and harness that that enthusiasm and then funnel it hard into something that's um like immediately satisfying by 
doing things that you're not great at and getting tangible improvement, but then something that is really sustainable because yeah, like our brains are the hardest part in all of this. Like training your body is kind of simple, but getting your brain to get on board with the plan um, and to do it consistently is often the hardest thing. So yeah, work with a coach like, you know, like you, I think the way you approach things is fantastic um, and have someone who can take the thinking out of it and just <laughs> like send you on the, like in that right direction, because yeah, I know when people, like if you try and do it yourself, you get shiny object syndrome and you'll just, um, you know, won't follow any one thing through. So that would be my, um, just to wrap up that last little bit. Um, yeah, but in terms of where people can find out more, um, yeah, my business is ADPT. So that's um, ADPT Physio. So uh, yeah, probably following the social medias for that or otherwise Phil White Physio as well. I've got my profile there. Um, and my website is adpt.physio. So if you are interested in um, yeah, doing some online physiotherapy and just quickly on online physiotherapy, um, as I've sort of talked about, like it, it's not the small little hands-on things that generally make the biggest difference to people. It is adapting your body to what you want to be able to do. So online physiotherapy can be really effective in doing that because it's often just getting um, that right understanding of the kind of training stimulus you need to get there with the considerations of um, your particular injury. So um, yeah, online physio can be very effective for that, but I always uh, make sure that um, when I do work with patients that if they are not a good fit for um, online physio, so if say someone like I had someone who'd recently ruptured their ACL um, and I was like, which is a, a very significant knee injury and I got in, and they got in contact with me and I said, <laughs> this is something like, this is something where you're going to work with like a close by um, health practitioner because there's just certain things where um, just the level of assessment is not quite um, and also close sort of contact is um, just not there. So I think it's very effective for a lot of things, but if you do get in contact and you want to um, try it out then, and I don't think you're a good fit, I definitely wouldn't charge you for it. So um, that would be online physio. Um, and otherwise, yeah, if you're interested in the accountability group as well, like if you already know what you need to do, but you just don't ever do it, um, then that, ADPT physio accountability group is open to anyone. Um, and as I said, I do kind of give the incentives of the uh, treatments in the gym, but I also do um, incentives of online free online physio or um, some programming as well. Uh, so if you are interested, then you can get on board with that. Perfect, mate. Well, I will link all of those in the show notes. And again, really appreciate you taking time out of your evening. Okay. Oh, it's been fantastic to chat.